For those of you who've been with us for a few weeks, you'll notice that, or you'll know that we are, are going through Philippians. Um, today is going to be our final uh, stage in Philippians this year, uh, as we then turn to Advent next year. And we, we've entitled this series, Deep Roots of a Joyful Faith. And I hope that in the seven sessions that we've had up to this point, uh, your heart has been encouraged with that reality. That we are to have a joyful faith, that, that faith in Jesus Christ is joyful. And it is to be deep. It is to be enduring and lasting because we are to never stop growing in our faith. Uh, and it's that sense of, of progress and of growth uh, that we're really going to dive into today. Uh, the faith is not static. Belief in, not, in Jesus is not a one-time thing that then never affects your daily life. But I, I wonder how readily we anticipate, how readily we expect to grow in our following of Jesus Christ. I, I wonder how hungry we are for that, I suppose. And if we are, then I, I wonder what we do to see that growth come about. But those are some of the questions that we're going to answer today. And they're also questions that we've seen up until this point through the book of Philippians. You may recognize some of that idea of progress and growth and development of faith. Maybe as you think back to uh, verse 6 of chapter 1, where Paul is confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. There, there's a sense of development there, isn't there? A sense of progression. And then, of course, we have that wonderful verse in, in verse 27 of chapter 1. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. That clearly, the belief that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ is to affect how we live. And so it seems that, uh, I'm sorry, yes, that's even continued later into, into chapter 3, as we'll get on to next year, uh, when we see in verse 12 through to verse 14, this idea of pressing on to take hold. What, uh, so forgetting what is behind, straining towards what, a, what is ahead. In verse 14 of chapter 3, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This idea that, that, that we are to grow and develop in our faith in Jesus Christ. Our knowledge of him is to grow. We are to learn more about him. As we will see in verse 16 of chapter 2 today, we hold to the word of truth, the word of life. Our knowledge is to grow. Our hearts are to become more malleable to him as we, as we invite him to have more and more lordship of our lives, more and more control as we, like John the Baptist said, we become less and he becomes greater. And therefore our lives are to reflect that as we live a life worthy of the gospel that we've been called to. In other words, believing the gospel of Jesus Christ directly impacts the way we live and should do. As we, as we read through the Bible, the, the idea and the concept of, of saying you believe in Jesus, but not living that way, it just doesn't seem to exist in Scripture. When you believe, your life is automatically impacted. There is a direct correlation when we think of genuine discipleship. That idea of allowing Jesus to affect everything that we do. Is, is what we see in scripture. And so today we're, go we're going to consider what it means for that faith in Jesus Christ to develop, to deepen over time and through experience. What does it mean for that to happen? In essence, we're going to explore the biblical concept of sanctification. Now, that, that might not be a word that excites you. It might sound like something that should be kept a theological library somewhere, but can I assure you, this is a deeply biblical word. This is a deeply joyful word. Because sanctification means becoming more like Christ, growing in Christ-likeness. And so this is a joyful process that every follower of Jesus should be able to experience in their life. And it's, what we'll see today is that sanctification is the work of God in the heart of every believer, transforming that person more and more into the likeness of Christ. And so today we're going to consider what that actually looks like and why that is so significant for us. I'd love for you to turn in Philippians chapter 2. We left last week in verse 11, and so we're going to pick it up in verse 12. I'm going to read all the way through to verse 18, although today we're actually only going to deal with verse 12 and verse 13. Uh, and I know that leaves us, uh, if, you're, if your Bible is, is um, divided up into paragraphs and heading, we're going to stop halfway through a section. And for some of you, that might feel very uncomfortable to take a, a four-week break before we come back in the new year. 
But, but if I can be honest, as I, as I was spending time in these verses this week, there was too much that I believe God wanted to say from verse 12 and 13. That either we were going to have a, a very elongated sermon, which isn't everyone's cup of tea, or we just slow down. We're, we're in no rush here uh, to, to work our way through what God would have us to, to learn today. So we're going to be thinking just about verses 12 to 13, but I'll read that whole section, verse 12 to 18. So here is God's word to us this morning. Philippians 2, verse 12. Therefore, my dear brothers, as you have... Oh, oh, sorry. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too, should be glad and rejoice with me. These great words, and we pray that God would speak to us uh, through them this morning as we invest our time in them. And so this morning in this whole passage, I think we can see several things about sanctification, about this growing in faith, growing in Christ-likeness as we seek to follow Jesus. We see the basis of sanctification, which actually takes us back into last week when we think of that wonderful hymn of Christ that Tim's already mentioned this morning. We see an example of sanctification in verse 15. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. That's an example of what it means to be transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ. And then we see the impact of sanctification in verse 16. That you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. But this morning, as I said, we're we're just going to consider that first point. Just the basis of sanctification. Verses 12 to 13. How is it that we can be sanctified? Why is that so important? Uh, And how do we enable that to to, to take place in our lives? And so let's consider verse 12. Because verse 12 begins with a word that we saw last week and we spoke of last week. It begins with, therefore. Can anyone remember the question that I said or suggested we should ask when we see therefore in the Bible? What's it there for? Thank you, Elian. Therefore. What is the therefore there for? And so what is it? What is it based on? What is what's coming next? What is, what is it based on? Um, and so as you glance back in your Bible, as you think back maybe to last week, we've known that the first, the, the first oh, sorry, up to chapter two up, to, up until this point has been about humility. It's been about how we should be living humble lives with one another based on the humble example of Christ. And we saw that last week with Jesus stooping low and now exalted high. And so that is the basis for what will then come forward from here. But the the reality that we are standing firmly on on the gospel of Jesus, that is where we then move into sanctification. So therefore, Paul says, God says to us, based on what we've seen of Jesus, and what what have we seen of Jesus? That Jesus has stooped low. He has left the glory of heaven. He has come to earth as a man. He has led the perfect, sinless life before choosing to go to the cross. And on the cross, he was taking the penalty of sin and not his own sin because he didn't have any. He was taking the penalty of the sins of the world upon himself. And as he died, the wrath of God was upon him and therefore he was separated from the Father. That, 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 that's the, the penalty that sin deserves, eternal separation from the Father. But as we saw that pivot at the start of verse 9, the, the hymn of Philippians 2 doesn't end with death. Because Jesus' story doesn't end with death. The gospel doesn't end with death. No, from verses 9 to 11, because of his perfect and complete sacrifice, God exalted Jesus to the highest place. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father. He is risen from the grave because his love is more powerful than sin and death, which has been conquered. Therefore, all who trust in his sacrifice in his place, turn from sin and to him, As their Savior and their Lord, they are welcomed into the eternal kingdom of God, forgiven from their sin, considered righteous in God's sight because they are clothed with Christ's righteousness. And so all of this, that is all 
because of Jesus' atoning sacrifice in our place to fully pay the penalty of sin that we rack up. And that means then that we can live as children of God, welcomed into his gracious and holy presence for now and for all eternity. And all of that is possible because Jesus stooped low and is now exalted high. And so that, that's an expanded view, if you like, of, those, of that hymn from verse 5 to 11. And because of all of that, Paul then says at verse 12, therefore, my dear friends, Right at the beginning of verse 12, our minds are cast back to that joyous image of Christ. And so that on the basis of what is to come, he is the foundation. Whatever Paul says next, it is because of Christ. And it is accepting his offer of forgiveness. It's having our sins forgiven by him. It is being welcomed into his eternal embrace, surrendering our whole lives to him, therefore. And so that's made clear for us. It is on the basis of Christ. And we know that, 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 that Paul is now definitely talking to Christians with that phrase, therefore, my dear friends, or in the ESV, it's therefore, my beloved, those who Paul is united with in Christ. And so for all who have bowed the knee to Jesus, this is what is to come. That is the basis of our sanctification. Verse 12 continues, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, see, always obeyed, you have obeyed the call of Christ. To, to repent of your sin, to turn to him as savior and to put his teaching into practice. Obedience is known. Obedience is visible. And we see that this is a working out of, of Matthew 28, of Jesus' commission to his followers at the end, just before he was ascended back to heaven. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And so to be a follower of Jesus is to obey his teaching. And as we, as we link that back to sanctification of growing in our likeness to Christ, obedience to him and his word is a key marker for that. Obeying his word, having our lives tangibly transformed by him and his teaching. All that, that obedience is evidence that we have already turned from our sin turn to him, that he is our Lord, and so we want to obey him. But we must always note, and I'm going to say this a few times this morning, that obedient living is the response to salvation. It is not the means to earn it. This is a wonderful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This should, this should, this should bring us joy. That, that, that our lives are transformed, yes, wholeheartedly, yes, we'll see that. But they are transformed in response to salvation, not as a way to earn that. Let me just share a couple of verses that show that so clearly for us in God's good word. Romans 5, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. We are justified through faith. Made righteous before God through faith. And because of that justification, we have peace with God. And that peace came through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the access that we have to the grace in which we now stand. You see, we are saved. We are justified. We have access to grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Nothing that we bring, nothing that we do other than come into him in full repentance and faith. He has secured our salvation. We see it again in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no one may boast. Sorry, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one may boast. It couldn't be clearer, sure can. We are saved by grace, not by what we do. We are justified. We're welcomed into grace by faith. And all of that is because Jesus has opened the way for us. Again, next chapter in Philippians, we're going to see this in Philippians 3, 9. Paul says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. It's so clear, isn't it? Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And therefore, as we think about sanctification, about the life of discipleship, which is an obedient life, let's always remember that obedient living is in response to salvation. It is not the way that we earn it. And we need to hold tightly to that truth, that biblical truth. Otherwise, we might completely understand, misunderstand 
Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Let me read those verses again, and, and we'll talk about a potential misunderstanding here. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. See, I think that the phrase that could cause misunderstanding here is continue to work out your salvation. Continue to work out your salvation. See, on first reading, we could misunderstand this to, to, to think that, that our salvation isn't secure yet, that, that there's, there's something needed to be added to it. There, there's, there's effort from our part to secure it, or there's something that we can contribute. But that would be not only a misunderstanding of this passage, it would also be a misunderstanding of all of those passages that we just quoted. So what is Paul meaning here? What, how are we to understand the process of continuing to work out our salvation? Well, it's helpful to recognize how the Bible speaks about salvation or being saved. Uh, and some people speak of the three tenses of being saved from sin. I found this incredibly helpful this week. Um, and so I wanted to share the, these thoughts from Stephen Lawson. I'll read a quote and then I just want to show you the summary of that. In the Bible, salvation is represented in three very different ways, in three different ways, past, present, and future. These three designations involve justification, sanctification and glorification in, in justification believers are saved immediately from the penalty of sin in sanctification they are saved progressively from the power and practice of sin and in glorification they are saved ultimately from the presence of sin i find that helpful uh, i hope that you do too because it, it helps us to see what it means to work out our salvation because Paul is clearly talking about that middle one, sanctification, that we are being saved progressively from the power and practice of sin. We are growing in Christ-likeness. We are continuing to work out our salvation. It might sound technical, but it's really important for us to understand because God is not saying some things through this verse. He is not saying that we must work towards salvation. That's, that's not what he says here. As if our salvation is not secure. As if our justification has to be earned by our own merit no justification is secure because of christ we are saved we are justified by faith alone in christ alone god is also not saying here that we work at salvation as if we contribute to salvation as if god saves us 90 percent of the way and we top it up by our good works no again that's the same misunderstanding no we are saved we are justified we are rescued from the eternal penalty of sin when we put our faith and trust in jesus christ we then grow in our discipleship our likeness to him as his spirit works in us transforming us renewing our minds and therefore our lives are transformed as a result of his grace not as a way to earn it and so to work out our salvation means that we live out the reality that we already know our sin has been eternally removed. So throw off the shackles of sin in your daily life. We read elsewhere in Paul's letters to put to death sin. Because sin is not who we are anymore. Do you remember how Paul addressed the letter to the Philippians? The very first verse, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus. You see, if we are in Christ Jesus, we are holy. That is who we are. That is our true identity. Yes, we wrestle with sin. Yes, we, we fight against temptation. But we do so justified before the Father. We do so knowing that when we mess up, that God is able and willing and will forgive us our sins when we confess them to him. We are, we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. Then we have this joyous journey of sanctification until the day we are glorified with him and sin is no more so yes we fight against it yes we 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 have to take action to put to death the sin that so easily entangles but the idea and the biblical teaching is we throw it off because it's not who we are we are god's holy people we have been redeemed paul says in in Chapter 3 of Philippians again, only let us live up to what we have already attained. 
Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. The gospel has saved us. Let's live in a manner worthy of that. And so we are holy. We we are clothed in God's sight with Christ's righteousness. And therefore, because that's who we truly are in Christ, having come to him in repentance and faith, claiming him as our Savior and our Lord, then we live that out. That's what we what the Bible. Uh, that's what I believe God is saying when we work out our salvation. We continue to fight sin. We chase after holiness. If you read through First and Second Second Timothy, particularly, notice how many times those two things go hand in hand. Flee from immorality and pursue godliness. Yes, we we, we turn from absolutely. We we flee towards, we pursue Christ, absolutely. We, it, this takes effort on our part. We'll come on and see that in a minute. But we do all of that because we have been justified. We are saved from, from the eternal penalty of sin. We are being saved from the presence of sin and we will be saved from sin in all its presence and glory. So obedient living is the response to salvation that is not the means to earn it. And as I said, th- th- this sounds like, and it should sound like, if I can say that, it should sound like this takes effort on our part. Th- there is something that we, we, we'll see in a second. We don't stand idly by until we reach glory. But we also must be cautious and, and cling to the reality and the great truth of verse 13. Because as we read in verse 13, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It is God who works in you. I, I'm not normally a fan of putting um, our, our, our scripture text on the screen, but I felt it helpful to, to emphasize it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. See, it, it, this, this journey to sanctification is God's work in us. It is with his direction, by his power. It is he who inspires our wills, It's he who enables our actions. And so our behavior is transformed, yes. And it is done so by his spirit indwelling within us. It is done so by aligning ourselves with his truth and his word. And so this is not simply a question of of personal willpower. This is the result of spiritual power, which can only come from God. However, and and this is why we do need caution, that that doesn't mean, as I've said, that we are somehow um, inactive spectators in all that God is doing in us. We still must take action. See, there is is a way in which we can close ourselves to what God is wanting to do in our lives that therefore inhibits his work in our hearts. God is longing to have full control over each and every one of us. He is longing to draw us deeper in our love for him and in our likeness with Christ. But we must give him the time and the space to do so. We must give him the time and the space to do so. It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose, yes but we must be open to his molding of our will and his guiding of our actions. And I wonder how we can do that. How do we open ourselves up more and more to God? Well, we saw it at the end of verse 12, that we continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. In essence, what I mean here is we live our lives in humble awe of the holy and righteous God who has saved us. This fear and trembling is is a reverent appreciation of the holy majesty of God. It's a recognition that we come before the God of the universe, the God who, who justly punishes sin, the God who rightly demands obedience because his ways are best. Therefore, demanding and commanding obedience is an act of love on his part. Any other way other than God's is not best for us. So he demands that we follow his way. What a loving God we have. So this is the God we come before. Yes, he is gracious and kind and tender and forgiving and merciful. 
But, but, but those attributes of God are not mutually exclusive from his almighty power, his dangerous purity, his, his ultimate justice. He is all of those things at all of those times. And so we come before him with fear and trembling. In light of who he is, we long to know him. We long to love him. We long to surrender to him. He is the, the God of the universe. And therefore, we open ourselves completely to him and ask him to work in us. And by his work in us, we will continue to work out our salvation. So if we want to see God transforming us more and more, we've got to humbly submit to his awesome presence. And that does take effort. That does take intentionality. That does take prioritizing time with him above other things. Yes, absolutely. But it is God who works it out in our hearts and lives. And the final phrase of verse 13 shows us the end result of all this sanctification. That we do all of this for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. In order, and the ESV says, for his good pleasure. We can please the heart of God by living our lives for his glory. What an awesome privilege that is. The, the, the majestic God who we come before with fear and trembling, we can live our lives in a way that pleases him, that brings joy to his heart. God's ways may not always be easy, but they are always good. As we consider then this morning, the, the, the basis for our sanctification, I hope you can see that these three things have come out. Uh, that we that we can be we can be sanctified because of Jesus' sacrifice in our place. Our sanctification sanctification comes from God. We can't take away our own sin. No, Jesus has done that for us. We are made holy by His purity. Therefore, we can lovingly and rightfully come into the life of humble obedience to God's word. In other words, sanctification is from God. He has enabled it. It is by Him. It is he who works in our hearts and lives to will and to act. And it is ultimately for his pleasure. Sanctification comes from him. It is by him and it is for him. Now, as I said, and I'll, I'll finish in just a moment. There's, I realize that that's a lot packed into two verses. Um, it, it maybe does leave us a little awkwardly in the middle of a passage as we now break for Advent. But I really felt the compulsion to dive into those two verses this morning because the, the, the risk of misunderstanding this in several ways can be really dangerous for us as we seek to live out a faithful life of discipleship to Jesus. I'll just mention two things. You see, firstly, I think if we wrongly assume that our justification is based on our behavior, then because we know ourselves well enough and know the failures that we have, we, we, we question whether we're truly saved. I'm sure all of us, if you follow Jesus for any length of time, you will have asked the question, goodness, do, does God really accept me? Look at the mess of me. How could he accept me? But remember, we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knew. Our mess is not a surprise to him. He loved us anyway. And so the security of our eternal salvation is not based on my ability. It is not based on my ability to be good enough for God. No, it's based on my ability to throw myself before the cross. My willingness to say, Jesus, I can't do this. I can't take my sin away. I can't make myself right with the Father. And Jesus says, I have done it for you. And so the, the reality of that of living in that, that doubt of our, of our salvation, it, it can render us ineffective for Jesus because we're so crippled by the sense of, how can I share Jesus with anyone? I'm a rubbish Christian. How, how can I volunteer for that position in church? How can I share some spiritual insight with a brother or sister in the Lord? I, look at the state of me. How would Jesus use me? Jesus has saved you if you have come to him in repentance and faith. If you are if you have claimed him as your Lord and Savior, he has saved you and he has a purpose for his kingdom for your life. 
Now, of course, we cannot, we, we cannot divorce lifestyle from faith, right? That, that's been clear. But what I'm saying is the, the, the confidence of your eternal salvation, the inheritance that awaits you from 1 Peter 1, is based on Jesus' sacrifice in your place. So be confident that he who began a good work in you will bring it on to completion. And that therefore, allow him, open yourselves to him to then be used in any way by him. See, if we have, if we have no desire, let, let, let me say this loving warning if I can, if we have no desire for holiness, if we have no, if we have no remorse for our willful sinning, then maybe God is trying to point to something in our lives to say, this, need, this needs to come before me. You need to lay this down. You need to return to me and allow me to take my rightful place as Lord and Savior again. But we cannot overstate the absolute security that comes from knowing that Jesus' sacrifice is enough to take away the penalty of our sin. Our lives are transformed, yes, but our lives are transformed in response to his grace, not to prove ourselves worthy of it. So that's the first potential pitfall of misunderstanding this idea of, of living out a holy life before God, that we, that we are seeking to live a life to prove our worth, to earn our salvation. No, we can never do that. Christ has done it all for us. But the second pitfall is equally as dangerous because it's equally as untrue. That, that we, this pitfall is that we recognize that, that God is at work that God does, brings everything to be, that, that God at will, uh, works to will and to act according to his good purpose. And therefore we sit idly by uh, and we don't give him, we don't work at, 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 at putting to death sin. We don't work at prioritizing time with him. We don't work at giving him the space in our hearts and lives to lay ourselves before him for his glory and for his purpose. So, so we, we sit idly by, we are inactive. But again, that doesn't seem to be what it means to continue to work out your salvation. So, so we, and I'm speaking to myself very much here this morning. I've been challenged deeply by this on, on the, the spiritual laziness that we can fall into at times. Seeking to take back the reins of our own lives. And it struck me this week. God is gracious in the way that he speaks to us sometimes, isn't he? But it struck, struck me this week how foolish that is. To not give him the space in our lives. To, to think that, that we know best. The God who loves us enough who went to the cross, yet... We think, no, God, it's okay. I've got this from here. No, the loving God wants and longs for your whole life because he has good things for you, far better than we could ever ask or imagine. And so maybe some of us need to come before him again this morning and say, forgive me, God, for everything else that I've allowed into my life other than you for all the times I've prioritized other things, for all the ways in which I haven't followed your very clear direction. Forgive us, Lord. Move in us, Lord. Come and work to will and to act in order to fulfill your good purpose. And so I realized this morning, um, that this could feel heavy, it could feel difficult. I, I, I hope that you are lovingly encouraged by God's word this morning. Because these are verses that help us see with increased clarity that our sanctification, our, our journey to Christ's likeness as we follow Jesus is based solely on the finished work at the cross. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And we are saved from sin and the eternal punishment that it deserves. And we are saved to a purposeful life of following Jesus while we give him control over everything. And that's, that's my hope and my prayer for this morning's message, that, that although I'm sure it's been difficult to hear, it's certainly been difficult to, to write and to say. But, but I, I hope that in the midst of this, we can see the joy that Jesus offers here. Jesus is, Jesus is offering life in all its fullness. A life Living under the Lordship of Christ is a full life. It is a joyful life. It might not be an easy life at times, but it is a joyful life because of that security of our salvation, because of the promise of his help and presence with us, 
Because knowing that, that our confessed sin is forgiven. And therefore we can live a life for his pleasure. This is joyful living from a biblical point of view. And it's joyful living that leads to living like stars in the sky that shine among a crooked and wicked generation. Uh, And so would you join me in, in joyfully praying that God would indeed empower us, equip us to do just this, to continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And so, our Father, would you sanctify us, we pray. Would you sanctify us by your presence, your power. Sanctify us for your glory. Help us, God. Oh, we need your help. We realize that the enemy crouches at every door, that sin seems to to raise its head and temptation seems to raise its head at every turn. Lord, would you help us? by the power of your spirit, that same power that raised Christ from the dead is now at work within us. And so would you help us to fight sin, help us to curb our tongues when we need to, help us to to kill that unhelpful and and, and judgmental spirit, help us to deal with, with the bitterness and unforgiveness that can wretch at our hearts. Help us, Father, to lay all things before you so that we may grow in the likeness to your son and that as we as you are at work in our hearts, transforming us, may our lives then reflect the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. That you are the one who saves. You are the one who eternally holds us fast. You are the one who who is is holding for us an eternity that will never, an inheritance that will never perish, spoil or fade. Lord, would would you come among us Would you show us those things in our lives and in our hearts that need to be dealt with you? And Father, I pray that for those of us who have, goodness, we might have sat in church most of our lives, yet we have never bowed the knee to you as our Lord and our Savior. Father, would you you encourage us this morning with the need for that, the, the urgency to have our sins confessed and removed from our account before you because of the loving and atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then would we would we rightfully place you as our Lord and our King? and live our lives in obedience to your word. Ah, come, Jesus, we pray. Move among us, we ask. Thank you for your goodness and your willingness to work in broken vessels. Lord, would you continue to do so for your glory. Amen.